Okay. Good morning and Merry Christmas to all of you. We hope that as we begin this week prior to the big day that uh, we will experience the goodness of Jesus Christ. Amen. All four Advent candles are now lit, and we want to remind ourselves of what each candle represents. The first candle, the first week of Advent, is the hope. Hope. Hope candle. As, we, as the people of Israel waited, as all the world waited, during that time of darkness, there was a hope, the promise of hope that was given. The second candle is the peace candle. We realize that uh, the hope was because peace may not come in our earthly situation right away, but there is peace that comes deep within our hearts with the arrival of Jesus Christ. The third candle is the joy candle. And if you've experienced the hope of Christ and the peace of Christ, joy just flows from our beings. Amen? And then finally, the fourth candle, the one that we lit before we started today, is the candle representing love. And as we get close to our time of prayer, we'll be singing, O Come All Ye Faithful. And as we sing that song, a member of our congregation will come and light that center candle, which is white as white, representing purity. And you know where the purity of hope, peace, joy, and love comes from? The person of Jesus Christ. So we will have the completion of the Advent candles reflecting the fact that in Jesus Christ there is hope, there is peace, there is joy, and there is perfect love. And all the people of God said, Amen. Father, we thank you for this special time of year. We thank you that you have allowed us through your grace to come together to worship Jesus Christ today. And we're thankful for the fact that in the busyness of all the activities that are part of this time of year, that you have graciously given us a time to be quiet, to reflect, and to respond to your amazing love. And our prayer is that as all these candles burn brightly, that that center candle, the pure white candle of Jesus Christ, that that light would shine brightly, not only in the center of an Advent wreath, but may it shine brightly, the person of Christ shine brightly in our lives. It's in the blessed name of Christ that we pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing the first Noel.
blitzing, it came upon a midnight clear. Through the two songs, we have been giving the story of the account that's told to us in Luke chapter 2. Last week, we began by reading the Christmas story in unison by reading Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I invite you to stand with me now, and once again, we want to continue and read the rest of this story that's so familiar to us. Uh, we will read responsively. I will lead us by reading the black print. And you as a congregation are encouraged to read and respond in unison by reading the red print. Please be aware, we are familiar with this story, but it's a timeless story. And no matter how familiar we become with it, there's always freshness, there's renewal, there's great joy when we reflect on this story. Luke chapter 2, beginning of verse 8, we read these words. And there were shepherds living out in the fields, 
nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary <coughs> treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. God's richest blessings be upon the reading of this sacred story once again. And now as we continue to worship, let's remain standing and let's respond to this invitation to come. Come and adore him. Let's worship together.
we pray. We're looking at this beautiful Advent wreath. Beautiful greenery. Trimmed in gold. Pine cones. Red berries. Four candles. Representing what our world longs for. Joy and peace and love, hope. Lord, we give our attention now to this center candle and to the person that it represents. We thank you for your perfect plan, Father. It wasn't a, oh, all else has failed, let's try this. It was a very plan of your son's coming and bringing us back to you. It was written in your heart throughout all eternity. And so we just pause to say thank you for the blessedness of your gift, Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for the fact that uh, we can not only tell the story of Christ being born in our lives, or born into our world, but we can experience the joy of Christ being born in the very center of our lives. And Lord, we thank you today, and we also want to pray for those who are part of our family, who are part of our community, that will celebrate Christmas without Christ. And Lord, our prayer is that uh, somehow, through us, through our interactions with our family, through our interaction with our co-workers, Amen. through our going to the bank to take out another piece of, another $20 bill to pick up that other gift, Lord, as we go through this Christmas week, may the hope and joy and peace and love of Christ be a living reality through us. In fact, we pause for just a few seconds, and in the hope and in the beauty of the light of Christ right now, we just quietly, silently in our own hearts lift up to you an individual that we are acquainted with, that we know, that we care about deeply, who will be celebrating, celebrating Christ, or celebrating Christmas without Christ. We lift their name their face, and their need to you right now. Jesus, we do pause to give you thanks because you willingly came to this earth. You willingly walk the streets that we walk. You willingly face the temptations and the sorrows and the burdens that we face. You willingly lay down your life. As the old song says, you could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and rescue you, but you went through with the Father's plan. And we thank you for that. We thank you for dying on the cross. We thank you, Father, for bringing Jesus his resurrected body back. And Jesus, we just thank you for who you are. And we also want to say thank you to the third person of the Trinity. Thank you, for the, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the fact that the story of Christmas can be a reality deep within our being because of the fact that you are with us, you are in us, and you are transforming us. And as we come to the close of our prayer time on this Sunday before Christmas. It seems appropriate that only with one more time, with just our voices, we would sing that chorus, Oh, come, let us adore him. One more time, just our voices. Let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore Christ the Lord. And all the people of God said, Amen. 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 You may be seated.
come out to? Charlene, would you come out to? Pastor Unger, could you come forward, brother? Standing right out there in front so they see the good looking one. <laughs> we just want you to know at Christmas time that we appreciate you so much. And a card, as good as they are, can never really express what our hearts feel for you and Pat. We miss Pat so much. Amen. And we hope that she will feel well enough to come back to us. But please give her our love at Christmas time here, especially. And know that you are greatly loved, Pastor. You're a fixture <laughs> <laughs> at Glenview. And the same with you. Um, you haven't been here 30, <laughs> 40 years. But you are dear to us. And we just want you to know at this time, we've been going through so much. Um, just, I know you have to be exhausted. <laughs> and, um, you know, just the mental strain, the emotional strain, the physical strain. We want you to know that we hold you up in prayer. Thank you. And that we trust our Lord to take care of you each and every day. And each and every mile back and forth <laughs> and back and forth. So we love you. We love Thank you, you all. Thank you so much for your love and your graciousness and your patience. Wednesday, this Wednesday, at about 11.20 or 11.25, I will be ringing a bell. <laughs> and I want you to know that I'm going to ring it so loudly that even though there are 400 miles between here and Columbus, you're going to hear it. Yeah. And, uh, just thank you so much. And uh, I am very excited and anticipating 2022. Yes. Yes. And uh, I know that the Lord who began a good work in us is going to take it to his completion. Yes. And there were a lot of hurdles that we had to cross. And sometimes there were mountains we had to cross my first uh, 10 months here. But... Uh, He's been preparing us, and uh, we're looking forward to a great 2022 together. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn with me to Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, for our responsive reading the last two weeks, we read the most familiar passage, which is Luke chapter 2. But uh, Matthew also has his side of the story. His side of the story reflects things from the uh, perspective of Joseph, and uh, we want to look together at Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18 and coming down uh, to the end of the chapter, which is through verse 25. Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, and I'm reading from the New International Version, which reads this way. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. Now, it sounds like a rather simple story, but it's going to unfold rather interestingly in these next few verses. The Messiah, Jesus, his mother Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her very quietly. But after he had considered this, angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, 
and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did exactly what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. During this time of year, we typically reminisce. We reminisce about the good memories that we have had in the past. And one of the memories I have is how every Christmas, my mom would take us, my mom and dad would take us to the Weaver family get-together. Now, Grandma and Grandpa Weaver lived in Akron, which is about an hour away from where we lived. And we would go there not only for the holidays, but uh, typically once or twice a month. We would leave church and drive up there, and Grandma Weaver would have the table packed with all her good food. I was amazed how many people she could feed. And, uh, but it was, those, it was just one of those times and the memories of Grandma and Grandpa Weaver are there. One thing I noticed about Grandpa Weaver was he was a big Cleveland Indians fan. And uh, he had his chair, and uh, he had a table next to his chair and a lamp on that table, and he also had a radio. And when we were there during the week, or even on the weekends, and the Indians were playing, whenever we were done eating, Grandpa would go and plop down his chair and turn the radio on and listen very intently to the Cleveland Indians baseball game. Now, beside his radio, he also had a jar, a jar that contained nickels, pieces of candy, and bubble gum. Mm -hmm. And as we'd be playing there, uh, every once in a while, we'd look at Grandpa, and he'd catch our eye, and he'd say, hey, come here. And we'd come over, and he'd say, come up here on my lap. And he would talk to us, and we had learned that at some point while we were on his lap, he was going to invite us to reach into that cup and take whatever we wanted, be it a nickel, a piece of candy, or a piece of bubble gum. And as youngsters, we anticipated when Grandpa would say, hey, come up here and sit on my lap, because we knew we were going to get a special treat from Grandpa's special jar. As I grew older... I became a little bit wiser, and I also began to understand something. You know, I began to realize the gift of the nickel, the candy, or the bubble gum was not the most significant part of what Grandpa was doing. You know what he was doing? He wanted to get to know his grandchildren. He wanted to converse with his grandchildren. He not only wanted to hear their story, he wanted to take some time to tell them about his story. Uh, see, the bottom line was the gift wasn't nearly as significant as the purpose and the reason behind the gift, which was the father getting to know his children and his children getting to know their father more deeply, more intimately. That's what this season is all about. We celebrate the gift. But we need to understand that God gives us his gift. God gives us his son, Jesus Christ, not only for the reason so that we can celebrate that God put on human flesh, but Jesus Christ is God the Father's gift to show us how much he wants us to get to know him. Yeah. How much he wants us to get to know him and how much we begin to understand how deeply he loves us and how he wants his purpose to be fulfilled in our lives. Amen. Our focus this morning, as we prepared to, to, to share with you, was Matthew chapter 1. As I said, verse 18 begins with a very simple description. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. He simply says, it was a normal day. It was a normal day with everyday situation. In fact, he goes on to tell us that the normal situation, that there was a young maiden by the name of Mary, 
and she was anxiously anticipating the day when her engagement to a carpenter named Joseph would be consummated. She anticipated that day. As a young girl and as she matured into her womanhood, she anticipated the day when she and her husband would become one. It was a normal day, normal circumstances, but you read further, and Matthew tells us that there was a mysterious, unusual aspect to this situation. Because into the plans of Mary and Joseph comes a third person. That third person is the person of the Holy Spirit. And they are told, uh, in Luke chapter 1, Mary is told, and here in Matthew chapter 1, Joseph is told. The third person who's going to be in the midst of your wedding plans is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. You've heard a lot about God the Father. You're anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. I just want you to know that the son that you are going to give birth to, Mary, the son that you are going to bring into your family, Joseph, though you didn't father him, you're going to bring him into your family, and the two of you are going to nurture and raise the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And how's this going to take place? Well, there's a third person of the Trinity, and he is actively involved. Mary, please understand that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. I wish I could tell you how that happened. I wish I could describe to you what it means when the Holy Spirit comes upon and invades our being. But it's the, myster the mysterious side of the story. It's the mysterious side of the gospel. See, Mary and Joseph's plans are, from the human perspective, interrupted by God's plan. And God's plan is not an interruption. In fact, it's the best news that the world had ever received as the fact was given God was going to bring his son into the world. And this baby was going to be born. And what the gospel writers want us to understand is that the baby changes everything. Would you please hear that? The baby, that center candle. Jesus Christ, when he enters into the world, when he enters into our lives, that baby changes everything. The birth of this child brings a transformation into a whole new direction and a whole new perspective of life. Verse 21, we read there, your, she, your wife, Mary, Joseph, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. This baby changes everything, and the reality is that the baby is going to be named Jesus, which is the word for Savior. He will save his people from their sins. In fact, the name of the baby reflects exactly what the baby does. This baby who was born at Bethlehem comes to us through the conception of the Holy Spirit with the Virgin Mary. This baby that Joseph adopts into his family, this baby that Joseph is going to nurture as his own, his name Jesus means the Lord saves. And for centuries, the people of God have been anticipating the arrival of God's promise. With Jesus, the Messiah's arrival, there's a deeper understanding of what God is providing. See, the people of Israel anticipated a transformation, all right. They anticipate a transformation of circumstances. They anticipate a political leader. They anticipated someone who would come in on a white horse carrying an army behind him, and with a great sword, he would strike down the Roman Empire, which is the last of the several empires that had come back and forth, battling over, tramping all over their country. But this gift is not a political warrior. 
Rather, he is Jesus who saves us from our sins. <laughs> year after year, decade after decade, century after century, the people of God would make that annual observance of the priests offering a sacrifice to cover their sins. Every year, they would march into to the capital city. They would bring their spotless lamb, and the priests would offer the sacrifice to cover their sins for another 365 days. But this baby, he changes everything. He is the one who will be the perfect lamb of God. And he will be sacrificed. His blood will be offered. His life will be spilled out. And you will be able, the promise is, you as the people of God will experience salvation from sin forever. Amen. No more coming back every year. No more coming back annually. No more dragging the kids back there to Jerusalem to offer up the sacrifice. No, no, no more trying to scrape together a few more bucks to buy the spotless lamb. Because this king, he's not only going to cover sins, he's going to wash away sins. Amen. The baby changes everything because his name is Jesus and he will save us from our sins. Verse 23, we continue, and uh, once again, the angel is speaking, and the angel, as he speaks to, Gabriel, uh, to Joseph, says this, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. What the Son of God is called, once again, reveals the nature of, our, of this son. He is a Savior who is God with us. If you have a pencil, if you have a pen, if you have a marker, I would ask you to highlight his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. His name is not God against us. There are many in our world who blame God for the circumstances of our world. My friends, the good news is God is not against us. He is for us. He's not above us. He's not around us. He is with us. In fact, the New Testament clearly teaches that the same Holy Spirit that comes upon Mary will also come upon and come into our lives. And our lives will be transformed. Amen. See, God is not against us. God is not above us. God is not around us. If you are a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, the good news is the Holy Spirit has moved into the very center of your being. Amen. He is with us. I was listening to Christian radio, or on the, yeah, my Christian radio station on my satellite this week, and I like stations that don't have commentators and don't have disc jockeys or whatever you call them on the Christian station. They mean well, but sometimes they are very frustrating to me. I wasn't in a very good mood. I was on my way down to another treatment and hadn't slept well. And the song says, we need God with us. And the, and the one person who introduced it said, you know, what we really need to experience this Christmas is God with us. And Char heard me probably argue something, but we don't have to ask him to be here. He's already here and around us. <laughs> See, we've got this idea that we need to invite God into our lives. We do. The key to understanding, however, he is all around us. He's constantly knocking on our heart's door. He's constantly working things for his purpose. You know what we need to do to respond with the reality that he's there and receive him by faith. We don't have to ask Jesus into our hearts. We just have to open the door. We don't have to beg for him to come in. Just respond. He's done everything necessary for each of us to experience a transformed new life. We just simply need to let him come in. 
He's not against us. He's not around us. He's not beside us. He came to write in us. The story is told that in the early 1950s, there was a missionary to Africa that contracted a disease in the African bush called Delharzia, a disease that in that part of the world is still prevalent today, but it's far more treatable. The missionary returned to the States to be treated for his illness. The doctors struggled and worked to bring about a cure, but they were unsuccessful. In just a few years, the missionary passed away, leaving his wife and three little boys. For several years, she tried to care for the boys all by herself. She was a nurse by trade and kept very difficult hours, but somehow, by the grace of God, she was able to keep her family together and put food on the table. God sent a wonderful Christian man into her life, and in the course of time, they were married, which also meant that these three boys had a new father. This gentleman's home was in Oregon, up on the Oregon coast. If you know anything about the Oregon coast, it rains a lot up there. In fact, the, the climate was much different from what the family was accustomed to, and yet they gathered up the family and moved together across state lines, and they became a family there in Oregon. I'd like to tell you that uh, those three boys weren't too impressed with their new dad. They weren't sure about their new dad. Truth is, they didn't want anything to do with him. And so what they decided to do was to stand back and make him buy every inch of their love and affection. They were rude. They were cruel. They were undisciplined. Fact is, they were angry. And that dad had to work hard at it because they refused to bend. Everything came to a head about Christmas time. The time when there are so many feelings and memories. And so the father packed up his saw and axe and piled the three boys in the back of his pickup truck and headed up into the mountains to find a Christmas tree. As they searched through the woods that day, slowly but surely, they began to laugh and unwind. The boys were beginning to have a little fun, and then they found that perfect tree, and they voted unanimously that it was the one to have, and each one took a turn on the saw, and finally, down it came. They drive it back to the pickup truck, threw it in the bed, and started home. But on the way, something happened. Their Christmas tree grew. When they put it in the stand, there was an obvious problem. It was so tall that it scraped the top of the ceiling and bent over against the edge of the molding. There was a collective, oh. Of course, in their minds was this question, what was dad going to do about our Christmas tree? Somehow, perhaps nudged by the Spirit of God, the young father recognized the power of a teachable moment. And sensing that for him it was now or never, he did something incredible. He once again went to get his toolbox, went up to the boy's bedroom, which is right above the living room, and cut a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> he cut through the carpet. He cut through the boards. He cut through the drywall. He cut through everything. It just so happened, yeah, right, that the boy's bedroom, right above the tree, they loved it. They had a Christmas tree downstairs in the living room and upstairs in their bedroom. They were ecstatic. And the truth is, my friends, 
in that moment, that man became a father to those three little boys. Through a simple action motivated by love, he said, I will do anything. I will do anything to be your father. A beautiful story of a man motivated by great love. I've got an even more beautiful story. It's eternal in nature. And when we look at this Advent wreath, as we look at that white candle, as we look at this baby in a manger, we must realize that it reflects the fact that our Heavenly Father will do anything, anything, to show us how much He loves us. As we're gathered here this morning, may we recognize the power of this hour. Please understand that the Heavenly Father is speaking softly to each one of us. May we understand that uh, what an incredible thing God has done through His Son. The truth is, God has cut through all of history. He's broken through any circumstance, whether they be the world's shared circumstances or whether they be our own personal circumstances. The Heavenly Father has done everything, everything possible to let us know he wants us to become his child. It's my prayer that as we sing a great Christmas hymn together. Silent night, holy night. That we would, right here, right now, hear the Heavenly Father saying, I will do anything. In fact, I have done everything to be your Father. Let's pray together. The hymn writer says, Silent night, holy night. All is calm. Ha! All is bright. Ha! You heard the news? We dealt with the Delta. Now we got to deal with the Omicron. presidential office says that the Omicron virus took them by surprise. <laughs> Didn't surprise our father any. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. May we, through the Spirit's presence, not only among us, but within us, experience a new birth experience a fresh breath of air, experience more than a Christmas, but may we experience a Christ. Like the shepherds, may we quake at the very sight of what God is doing and what he has done for us. May our song reflect the song of the angels which sings, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to all people. And Lord, we understand that the peace to all people will only come when there's peace deep within us. And Lord, we love that one verse of this great song that says, the beams of radiant, gracious light, the light of redemption. 
Thank you for taking us back. Thank you for cutting a hole in our ceilings. Lord, may the light of God through Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit pop through that hole in our ceiling. As we worship together, as we sing very prayerfully together, I know who you are by face. I know where you sit in church. God knows where you are in your walk of faith. On this Sunday before Christmas, as we sing Silent Night, may be all be calm in your heart and all be calm and bright in your life, not because circumstances will change, because Jesus Christ has been born. We join that angelic choir. Christ the Savior is born, born in my very life. Christ the Savior is born. So Thank you for your light, Father. Thank you for the light of Jesus. Oh, we sing together. Redeeming grace. Jesus 
begin this hour with my saying have a Merry Christmas we end it with may Christ the Savior be born in your home this week God bless you have a great day a great week of celebration we'll see you back on July 2nd You understand, don't you? It's just a bit fuzzy up here. We will see you January 2nd. God bless you. <laughs> Have a great day.